I had to defend. today about uh, generative testing. The, the title of the talk is Generative Testing Component Systems. I will talk about that a little bit, but I think uh, there are some people here who haven't really, are new to closure and don't know about generative testing at all. So I'm going to kind of start from the beginning with little building blocks and work the way to the component thing. Uh, so, first of all, like why test? Anybody, why test? Why would you write a test? Huh? Safety? Sure. Huh? Thank you. You win the prize. Confidence. I've read your mind. You read my mind. That's great. Yeah, the build confidence that you're going to deliver something that's going to work the way it's meant to work, right? Now, let me ask you the other question, which is why would you not write a test? ROI. Interesting. Okay. That's kind of close to where I'm going, but more? Come on, this isn't only my talk. You guys have to help. In a hurry, you're in a hurry. So it's the same kind of thing. It's like you want to move faster. So so the thing I like to think about is that it's a liability. Right? So, so maybe you've heard this expression that code is a liability. Right? The more code you have, the more code you have to maintain, the more code, uh, the, the more time it takes to keep it together as the code base grows, things impact each other, and tests are code too, so this is why we don't. However, however, uh, even when we're not testing, we do. Right? And what I mean to say is even when we're not testing in an automated way, we're always testing then. We're always, you know, especially in closure, we have the REPL and we can mix new functions. Uh, so, example based example tests, which is one style of testing, it's different from generative testing, uh, often it's just a reflection of the kinds of things that we do. We execute a single function and, and with specific inputs, and then we get back, uh, you know, hopefully, what we're looking for. And if not, then we know something went wrong. Um, so, there are really good things about example-based tests. Those of you who know anything about my past know that I'm, I'm a big fan of them. Uh, so, they serve very well as communication, um, like a clear expression of intent. Uh, you can use them to kind of tell a story about a thing. So, so here, like, uh, there's a classic TDD exercise where you build up a bowling scoring game. And one of the tests is that a perfect game in bowling, where you roll nothing but strikes, you get a 300. And so that's like a famous value that everybody knows. Uh, the freezing point is 32 degrees in Fahrenheit and zero in Celsius. So let's use that as, the, as an example. So here is a function that converts a Fahrenheit temperature into a Celsius temperature. Um, so what, what kind of test might you write for this? Yeah, yeah, just one, so a minute ago I said the freezing point zero, right? So you might write a test like this. And you used exactly the words. You must have seen my slides before. Um, so yeah, this would be a good place to start. And so we write a test like this and we run it and it passes and yay, happy. But, you know, in the traditional TD way, you know, what you do to make that pass is you make it return zero. Uh, so we haven't gotten very far. So you add another test and that's going to be the boiling point, which is not this. So, what would be a logical next one? We've got these two points, 
Certainly that's not enough tests to feel confident that this function works. So, any ideas? So, so it turns out that minus 40 in centigrade is the same as minus 40 in Fahrenheit. And the reason none of us know this, besides the fact that we're not mathematicians apparently, is that uh, like once it gets down below zero, no matter how you slice it, it's just too cold to go outside and we don't think about these temperatures. But this is a really interesting point to, to write a test at, right? So we'll add that. Um, so minus 40 in Fahrenheit yields minus 40 in centigrade. And so, uh, so then if, if you go, an interesting fact about that too is that all of the values above minus 40 are going to return a value that's less than you put in. So, so centigrade is always less than the Fahrenheit value until you get down to minus 40. And then when you get below minus 40, it goes the other way. Every value is going to return a greater centigrade value. So this is a really interesting property for us to be able to test. So we have this test now. Uh, we've got a few different points. But here, like we're only testing one value from, from these things we call equivalence classes, right? So we're interested in all of the possible values that are greater than minus 40 and all of the possible values that are greater than less than minus 40, not just one value, right? And so this is a, a, a deficiency of example-based tests, right? So the space of possible inputs is much bigger than the examples that we're going to want to be able to use. And this is just for a single function. This gets much worse when you have a bunch of functions that are all playing together and you have a common plural explosion. Uh, and I think we've all experienced this as the code base grows. Uh, it gets harder to maintain. You, 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 first of all, there's just the, the side by side uh, sort of double entry bookkeeping of, of change some code, you have to change the test. If you're doing test driven development, you do it the other way around. Uh, but worse, you, you change a, some code and then some test over in another part of the system changes. And so this all becomes very difficult to maintain. So, property-based testing, the idea behind it is that you're going to generate random inputs from all the possible inputs that, that fit within some category. Uh, so, um, in our case, you know, it, it could be any number, but we're kind of interested in like separating them out at the minus 40 division point. And then you have all of these randomly generated inputs, you run lots and lots and lots of tests, and then you make an assertion that a general property holds true for all of the inputs within a given category. So uh, I'm going to talk about closure spec and how we can use that to do generative testing. So how many of you have used closure spec for anything at all? Okay. Um, how many of you knew that it wasn't just a validation framework? A smaller number, but some, right? So, you know, spec came around and a lot of people make comparisons between spec and, and uh, prismatic schema, which I guess now prismatic schema. And they do a lot of the same things in terms of validation, and there's also a library for generating data uh, using the schema. But the goal of closure spec was that when you, this by the way, I, on some of these slides, there are links at the bottom, I'll put, make these slides available to everybody at the end of the day, so don't worry about remembering any of this, but you'll be able to review it, and especially don't try to read those unless you have asked for anything. Um, so, we want to get all of this different value out of uh, out of writing the spec. We should get validation, error reporting, I'm not going to really talk about the structure today, but instrumentation, test data, test data generation, and test generation, not just the data, but actually generating the test for us. So how does that all work? So let's start with the validation part. Um, so we're requiring the closure spec namespace, uh, and you ask, is this valid for a number? So number here is a predicate, and closure spec takes that and kind of turns it into a spec internally. Uh, and then obviously, you know, yes, three is a number, but three is not a keyword, right? So it's all clear. 
Another thing that we could do along the validation lines is we can conform a value. So there are some kinds of specs that I'm not going to go into right now where you actually make some modifications to the output. This is not the same as coercion, but I don't want to get too sidetracked. But if you try to conform something that it can't do it, it's going to give you back this keyword invalid. Everybody good so far? All right. So uh, you can also make a spec explicitly. So you can say, hey, I'm going to define F, meaning Fahrenheit. That the spec for that is it's a number. So we're saying, we, you can give me any number if it's in this function, and that's totally fine. You cannot give me a keyword, however. All right. And then once you have a spec, you can get a generator from the spec. You just ask for a generator. That's kind of cool. So the generators come from this other library called Closure Test Check. Uh, Closure Spec uses it for all the generation, uh, and it also adds on some things. But the, the generators that you get from Closure Spec are Closure Test Check generators. And so all the things that you could do with, with generators from either library, will they're interchangeable. You'll be able to do the same things. Uh, but we won't be talking much about that library. So once you have a generator, then you can generate things, right? So you can either use the generate function, you can make one thing, or you can make use the sample function, and you can make anything. So by default, it's going to make ten, and then you can tell it, "I want a million. Go get some coffee." Uh, or three, you know, because the things you're making are really big, and you don't want your Emacs to stop working. Um, so once you have a generator. Now you can take the you can take the generator and generate some values, and you could validate that those values are legit. So this is a nice thing. It's like you have the spec; it can generate values that it can validate, and that's an important place to be because you don't want it to generate values that aren't going to pass its own validation. So you can you can do this yourself this way, or you can use this function. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I jumped ahead. Here, I'm conforming against the keyword, so everything's invalid, right? So there's a function in, in closure spec called exercise, and that's exactly what it does. It generates, by default, 10 values, and then tries to conform them, and then uh, it gives you tuples of the two values, the input and its conformed value. In this case, all the conformed values look the same. So, First message of the day is exercise all the specs. And this is why. Uh, we want to be able to use all of these for generative testing. And I don't know if any of you have tried to do generative testing, but it's really, really frustrating when you go to make a generative test and you have a whole big suite of specs, and it turns out that some of them can't actually be used as generators. Because, so, a bit of information about that. Uh, Closure spec does its best to make a generator for you automatically. And if it's a very simple, if you're using any of the predicates in closure, it does a pretty good job of that. But you can also make more elaborate specs where you say, hey, I want a number, but it's got to fit in some range, or it's got to be you know, negative or positive or this and that. And the, the more you do that, the, the more difficult it gets for it to generate values that will pass its own spec. And so uh, make sure that they can all uh, uh, generate and this link here. I've just got some helper functions in a gist, and you can grab it and it it will give you some ideas about you know way to do it. Basically, I make this a test in every project, and it's part of the test suite and it runs. To make sure that every every spec can generate. So another thing we want uh, from closure spec is a generative test. Well. Yeah, yeah, generative test generation. So we've been talking about uh, generative data, right? Now we're going to talk about tests. So just like before, we generated some values, and then we conform them to validate them. Here, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, give me some values, and I'm going to stick them right into the function that we're trying to test. And so here, we're looking at the input and the output we get from the function. Can't do much of a test by looking at that necessarily, but you get the idea. Right. Hand off the data to a function and run it a bunch of times. So there is a function in closure spec that'll do just that for you. 
right? And this doesn't do any validation. And also you'll notice that when I, when I did it here manually, all of the input values are just scalar values, but really what goes into arguments is the sequence, and so we're getting back all of the arguments. That's why they're all in lists. Um, all right, but, but still, we're not getting any validation at this point, right? We, we get some validation because we're not getting any exceptions. That's, that's, that's good for something. But um, here's where it starts to get fun. If it's not fun already, <laughs> uh, so here we've got another namespace in closure spec, um, closure spec test alpha, and this has a function called check. And check, as you might imagine, means on closure test check, and it will take a spec. So here we're making a spec for a function. This is an f def, right? And we can say, here's the name of the function. And these are the arguments that we should expect. It's a sequence of one thing that we're going to label f, and we're going to, we're going to say that it's got to meet the double colon f, whatever namespace we have in the f uh, spec that we wrote before, which means in this case it's going to be a number. Um, and then you can run check, and it will run by default a thousand tests. It happens very quickly. It's easy to generate a bunch of numbers and run, run a bunch of them. So at this point, uh, you know, we've got the function, we've got our test, and uh, that's generative testing. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so what don't we have yet? What's that? Properties, right? So if you look at this, like we know we can give it a number, and we know we're going to get back a number. And that, that's some value, that's not zero, right? But um, it doesn't really tell us anything about the relationship between the arms and the return value. And there are going to be a lot of cases where you don't care, right? Um, but there will be a lot of cases where you do. If you think about properties, the idea of a property, think about like a function that just sorts a list. So one property of, of, a, of that function is that it's going to be the same size as the, the list that you gave it, right? And you have to know how big the list was that, that you gave it in order for it to be able to, to know that that property holds. Um, so there's another thing. There's another thing. This is, I'm using my words. Uh, there's another thing that we can add to uh, to FDEC, which is the function argument, and this will be handed a map with the keys args and ret for return value. And then we can make any statements about the relationship between them in this, in this function. And it's up to you to write this function and you return true if it passes all the properties that, that you think should be there. And it returns false if it fails any of them. And that's, that's, you have to do that. So these are the tests that we had before. Um, you know, the freezing point and boiling point probably aren't that interesting in this context. But it'd be good to leave them in an example-based test because that someone could look at that and go, oh, now I know what you mean by a Fahrenheit to centigrade converter, because I know those things. But we'll just deal with the, the minus 40 and then the, the, the values around it. Um, and so here's a way that that could be expressed, right? Um, I don't care to get into the details, but you get the idea. If, if, if we've got exactly minus 40, then, then we should get minus 40. If we've got greater than minus 40, then the Fahrenheit should be greater than centigrade. If we've got less than minus 40, then the Fahrenheit should be less than centigrade. Clear? So, remember, it'll run this test in a thousand times. That's pretty good. And so, first thing that happens is, whoops, we generated infinity. This is not a number you would have thought of handing to your generator, to your, to your uh, conversion function, right? And so that's interesting. Uh, and this is one of the great benefits of generative testing. It will find values that you really didn't think of. And it, it, uh, so in this particular case, you know, we've got the function, we've got the spec, and it brings the question, which is the correct thing? And the answer is not always going to be the same. It's really a good question to think about. In this particular case, What's, what's correct? Is it the spec or the, the code? Anybody? Put, put the question differently. Should I modify the spec to account for the possibility that we might generate infinity or receive infinity? Or 
or should we modify the code so that it can have special case handling for infinity? Huh? No, it does not depend. I have a very strong opinion about this in this case. <laughs> so I guess it depends on whether you are me or you. <laughs> Um, but it, generally speaking, yes, it depends. In this particular case, I don't want to gum up a function. I've got this simple function that's perfectly clear. This is a well-known formula. Why do I want to mess that up? Right? So in this case, I think this, the, the, the code's fine, and we're going to modify the spec. And it turns out that not a number is another value that will come up. Right? So we've got now more conditions here, more properties. So if we get infinite, then it's going to be infinite. That could work for uh, positive or negative infinity. Same with not So, and then we, we run that, and it runs a thousand tests, and we're happy, right? Except, if we're going to generate from all of the possible numbers, a thousand numbers, what do you think the likelihood is that we're going to hit minus 40? Because that's one of our tests, right? Well, it turns out that it's pretty low. Um, I did this. I tried it 10 times, and one time, running a thousand examples each, one of those thousand examples was minus 40. Okay, so let's try 10,000. Well, still got some zeros. I'd like a little more confidence than that. And this is just a game. There's no, there's no magic about this. You find the sweet spot. I found at some point, I got to 25,000, and I'm like, okay, I'm pretty, pretty convinced that we're always going to get this. Now, the re in reality, like, when you run these tests, they generate different random sets every time. And so, eventually, there would have been a test failure, but who wants that? Like, everything, all the tests are passing and passing and passing, and then you go to push it through your, your production system, uh, through your, your CI pipeline, and, you know, and then it fails. And you're like, wait, it's always been passing. So, this is kind of a good idea, I think. Find the sweet spot in terms of the number, Make it as low as you can, because it takes time to run all these. So once we do that, ha! Look at that. We got back the, the long value, minus 40. That's what we generated. And what the function returned was the big int, minus 40. And they're not equal. Who knew? Um, so I've been writing closure first time I encountered it was maybe 10 years ago, I want to guess. And I read some books back then, and in those books I, I read that there's a double equals function in Clojure that handles a uh, numeric conversion for you, and uh, I didn't remember that. Um, so, but I, I went and looked, and uh, oh, I skipped ahead again. Same question, right? Which is wrong, and you know my answer. We're going to change the, the spec and not the so, uh, if you go to uh, this link, which is guides, the, the closure guides for equality, you'll see that there's this double equals function you can use. So, we do that, and then everything works great. So, that's cool. I learned a little bit more about closure because I was generating a bunch of values. I wasn't expecting that, but that's cool. Um, all right. I've been doing training all week, so at this point, I'm like, are there any questions? Which is not the same thing we necessarily do. In conference talk. But are there any questions? Yeah. Using what kind of I know of nothing that, yeah. It clearly is too good. Yeah. <laughs> he asked if it would be an interesting idea. I, I, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really interesting area, but I think it's a very complicated thing. I don't think we're going to do it, uh, but uh, he's talking about, like, to be honest with you, you're, you're saying some things that I have no experience with, but doing kind of like, uh, uh, what was the term you used? Fuzzy 
generation for them. Generative fuzzy models. So where where we can basically more be, be better at generating good generators on the fly. And I don't know of any particular work that's happening in that area, and you should definitely start it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So another thing that we want out of uh, Composure Spec in terms of leveraging uh, once you have a spec is decent error reporting. So uh, yeah, so here I broke the code. I refactored and messed it up. I put a 31 with should be a 32. So the feedback that we're going to get is a lot, and it, as difficult as that is to read, it's actually not even that pretty. It's all on one line. But if you go and look down at some of the details, there's an interesting thing that happens. And it, it, I tried this, and I ran this dozens of times, and the value that failed was always either minus 39 or somewhere between minus 39 and, and minus 40. And so what that does is it sort of, so this idea of shrinking is when there's a test failure, um, it's going to try and run a bunch of tests and try and narrow it down to the smallest uh, input that, that you can provide in order to, in order to produce the, the invalid state. Um, this isn't a super great example of this because you still have to think quite a bit about, well, what does that mean that it's minus 39? But still, it's helpful compared to if it was like some, any, any other number, right? Like the fact that it's there, it makes you think, oh, it's close to the boundary. Uh, it might give you some ideas to what's going on. All right, so another thing that we want to get out of closure spec is instrumentation. Uh, and so what do we mean by that? We, there's a function, instrument, and when, when we call it, it's going to instrument the, the F to C converter uh, function so that it will validate inputs. Anytime it gets called, it's going to validate that it got input that meets the stack. It's a really nice feature for testing. This is not something that you want in the production code, uh, but when you're developing or, or running on beta tests, it's a really handy thing. Um, so, and you get, this is the kind of feedback you get. So, we were saying uh, it should be a number. We give it a keyword, and you can see here the predicate that it failed was number, and the value that we got was a keyword. So it's very clear about what went wrong. And it, you know that's cool because we're calling the function directly. But what's better is when you're calling another function that uses the function that you instrumented, right? So when you instrument functions that are in your system while you're working on other parts that might call them. This will raise flags for you while you're doing that sort of development and testing. Um, and you get the same feedback, right? So we call the function that uses our converter. Our converter, for, oh, by the way, I, I didn't point out, I intentionally wrote a terrible implementation that receives a number and then just hands it a keyword anyway, right? Uh, I'm sure we've all made that mistake, right? Um, so anyway, the feedback that we get is it was trying to call this function and uh, no, it, actually, it doesn't tell us the function, does it? It just tells us the spec that failed and how it failed. So I guess in a big system, you might have to go dig and figure out where that happened. Uh, but you can always name the specs more particular to the functions if you want to do that. All right. So in this case now, uh, we're taking that same idea and generating a test of the, of the function that uses the converter. Right? So we've, we've given it a spec that it should receive a number, uh, and then we call exercise, and having nothing to do with the, the function that we're testing right now, the fact that we instrumented the other one gives us the feedback that we called it on. It's kind of nice. All right, so instrument all functions. Again, this is in development, in test, don't do this in your production code because what, it, what it's actually doing is it's rewriting your functions. It's clobbering your functions and, and wrapping them in some boilerplate stuff that allows for the instrumentation. Uh, so it's not going to, it's not necessarily going to hurt you unless you know, one of those things stops you from your system from running. But also it's just extra processing that you don't really need and extra namespaces to load that you don't really need, etc. All right, um, so this is supposed to be about component systems. Uh, hey, uh, 
I started to look a bit late. I've only got how late can I go? Somebody who's in charge. Who's in charge? As long as you want. As long as I want. All right. I hear from one of the sponsors of the conference that I could go as long as I want. Right, good. So component systems. So when I first thought of this, I was thinking specifically about uh, component systems in, in uh, using Stuart Sierra component. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you're using that library or not. It's more about how we use, how, how we uh, put things together when we are using that library as components. So this has nothing to do with state of the component system or starting things in the right order, but it is just about how you assemble things. So um, this is a, uh, a distillation of a, a, an actual project that, I'm, that I was working on with another customer. And so there's this part of the system where people can submit documents. It's just like forms. Uh, and the forms can be different, so each form has its own schema. So when you, when you go to submit, and obviously there's, there's other steps before and after this, but this is just the submit step. There's this request handler that first says, okay, is this user uh, authorized to write to this document? And then we validate the request is in good shape, um, we go get the schema for this document, and then we validate that the document is actually matching that, step, that schema, and then finally we do the schema. And uh, we, could, we could get lost in talking about why these things are organized this way. These were, there's a bunch of choices. What's up? I've got seven more minutes. Wow. All right. Let's see. I'm on slide 64 of 88. What do you think? Seven minutes? Can you do it? <coughs> All right, so um, the way we uh, assemble uh, components in a component system is we, we make protocols, and so we've got an off plan protocol that just has this one function, right? And and this is this is a pattern I've gotten into. I'll, I'll make this like dash right and then have a wrapper function for it. And the reason I do that is because it turns out that if we try to stub the protocol functions, we can't really do it because of when things uh, are bound. I don't actually understand the fine details of it, so someone else can do talk about that. Uh, what's that? Oh, I thought someone was going to explain it, but not on my seven minutes, please. All right. So, and then we write a, a function definition, and so we've got the args, and here we've got three different arguments. So we've got the client itself, uh, then the user, and then the request. Now. The return value can be one of two things. It can either be success, in which case it has to meet the spec or the, the client response, or it's going to be an anomaly. Right? How many of you are familiar with Pyrotech anomalies? No? A couple. Uh, so basically, um, I'll just get by that. So anomalies is a library, and here's the link to it. Um, and calling it a library is a little bit aggrandizing because it, all it is is a very simple spec for the shape of a map. And that map, for it to be an anomaly, has to have this key, Cognitech Anomalies Category. And there is a set of values that would be down to that key. One of them is incorrect, that you have things like not found or unavailable. Some of the things that you would think of associated with you know, calls to HTTP services, um, but kind of organized with a different thing. And, don't need to go into that detail right now. So the point is, uh, the way, the pattern that I've adopted here is that all of the client functions that are clients of other services, they're always going to return either valid data or an anomaly map. Never throw an exception. Right? That's sort of the goal. And the, the reason for that in this context is when we're doing generative testing, we want everything to be about data. And it's going to mess us up if we have to worry about exceptions. So it's up to each of those functions to take care of catching exceptions and returning the right amount. And then the service function, our handler, will also catch exceptions in case any of those other pieces don't meet that contract, uh, and then return an anomaly as well. So uh, here's the, the protocol for the, the dot client, which was the other piece of it. Details don't matter here. Uh, we've got a bunch of specs. They all do that same thing. They all either return some form of valid data or a non-fault anomaly. And that's that's important for this because so 
default is sort of the catch-all. And we typically use that for catching exceptions, right? Because the other things we can kind of reason about if it's this kind of exception, uh, it's this kind of anomaly. But if we have no idea, then we throw up our hands and say fault. So we don't want in our in our generators, especially, to have a fault. Uh, so, so here's this function. This is the function from that picture that I showed you just a little while ago. How many more minutes? I wasn't. I didn't look. Hey, no. How many more minutes in? Four. Wow, that was a long three minutes. Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, so there's a lot of nesting here. But at each, of these, at each of these stages, and you could certainly picture this organized differently, but this is how it was organized. At each stage, we're saying, if I've had good data, then keep going. If I've got an anomaly, return it now. So it kind of short circuits out. Uh, and so we go in and we instrument. Remember that the protocol functions all had started with Python, and we had these wrapper functions. So we go in and we instrument all the wrapper functions with stub. So this is another feature of, of the instrument function. What stub does is it says, okay, I'm going to validate all of the inputs for all of these functions, and I'm not going to execute any of them. Well, the, 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 these lists happen to be the same, right? But the ones that you list in stub, we're not going to execute the function. Instead, we're going to generate data that meets the return value spec for that function. So that all of the other so all of the other pieces, they don't even exist yet. Like I made sure all this code runs when I was doing this, and uh, there's no implementations of anything but the handler, right? Which is kind of where you want to be doing this kind of stuff. So uh, and then so these now, and this is sort of key to all this working too. So we're going to get back all these different kinds of anomalies, right? So what I've got here is I'm saying, okay, I'm not going to get any faults, any fault anomalies, but I am going to get some successes because now what we have is like four or five different moving parts that all might return valid data and, and invalid data. How many example-based tests is it going to take to get all of those combinations, right? You don't want to maintain any of that. So, so we're doing it for you. And, but you just say, okay, I get some success, I get some for, you know, forbidden, they're not authorized. There's two kinds, either the request is invalid or the doc is invalid. And you just make sure that there's some distribution. And in, in most cases, uh, you just make sure that there's any distribution, but you can imagine where it would be meaningful, what the distribution is, and you can write tests that specify that as well. Um, oh, wow, okay. So, sometimes, the, uh, the, the, the specs that we write um, don't provide enough global specificity to what we need. So we need, uh, we've got two services that we're using and some of the values have to relate to each other in some way in order to have a successful execution. And so what you can do is you can actually generate the components themselves, right? So here is a generator, and this is using the, the, the uh, coach aspect that gen that out on library. Uh, and this generates a reification of this auth client protocol. And what we're saying is generate a Boolean, and when anybody calls the right function, just return that generated value. So it's going to be different in two minutes. Yeah. I'm not kidding if I'll have my staff in place. All right. Um, so here is a similar idea for the, the doc client, and then you put it all together inside the manager. Now, the important thing is not the details. You can learn about all that. But the important thing here is we've got a function. Right now, that function's not taking any arguments. All of these were functions. We can give them all the arguments that we want, and we can connect these things however we want and build up this generator of generators of generators that have values that they share that are generated. So you're not hard coding these things. You're still using generated data. It's just that you're being able to uh, associate them with each other. Um, and then, so, so I built up that generator, and now I'm saying, OK, for the manager, instead of using the default generator, I want to use this one that has my special customized components. All right. So I'll just zip through this. So this is hard, hard, hard. But this is kind of pretty. So what we did was we took all of those nested 
additionals, and we wrap each one in its own function. And this is this is the same idea with like pedestal interceptors and ring handlers and whatnot. And so we're building up a context with the request and then the clients and the user, and then each of the functions takes the context, pulls out the bits that it needs. They all return either uh, data, valid data, or an anomaly. Right? And this is a really nice way to break it up because everyone's nice and isolated. I'm so sorry that I'm talking so fast now. But, uh, and then this is a function, and again, you'll have the slides, uh, that actually makes that work. So it short circuits out as soon as it, uh, you, you give it a list of functions, it ex executes them, passes stuff through, and it short circuits when you get to the one that throws the anomaly out. And uh, guidelines, oh my god. All this stuff and all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>